It was hoped that the Green Belt would protect some of the best agricultural land in southern Ontario. And joining us now for her view on life on the Green Belt, here's Avia Eek. She's a King Township Councillor and a Holland Marsh farmer. Nice to have you here at TVO. Well, thank you, Steve. It's nice to be here. Can we talk about the farm? Oh, I'd love nothing better. Okay, where is it? Our farm is located in the Holland Marsh, and we're more in the, in the, um, in the center of the Holland Marsh. 10,000 years ago, it was Lake Algonquin. And um, I've been living there since 88 when I married my husband, who was a third generation farmer. His great uncle was one of the first residents or first settlers in the settlement of Anstervelt in 1934. Well, that's great. So let's situate it for those people who live outside Toronto. You're what, an hour and change north of Toronto? Not even. Not maybe, even maybe, maybe 40 minutes. We're <laughs> right off the 400. You can see the 400 from my backyard. Gotcha. That sounded very Sarah Palin, you know, when you said, I can see. Anyway, <laughs> you can't see Russia from your backyard. No. I can't see Russia, no. Okay, good. <laughs> Uh, what do you grow there on the farm? We grow carrots and onions. Um, when I first married my husband, we grew celery and lettuce. And things in agriculture change from time to time and through policy decisions. And so now we're just down to carrots and onions and we grow potatoes for our local food And what's food with bank. the earrings? Oh, <laughs> well, you know what? I, um, there was a time when, when I, I had an opportunity to meet the Premier. and Which one? Premier Wynne. Okay. And... Um, and it was funny because people, you'd think that people would remember me because I talk incessantly about the marsh and farming and stuff like that. And so then I had another occasion to chat with her and she said, I remember you. And she said, and you've got your carrot earrings on. <laughs> and, um, and, and it's funny because people don't remember me for me. It's all about the earrings no, I, and it's all about the carrots. So Avia, since I am a carrot farmer, I, I promote disagree. it. I say you're unforgettable even without the earrings. <laughs> I'm gonna remember you forever. Uh, how big an operation have you got? We're mid-sized, we have 85 acres. When, and about um, 60 of it we own, and the other 20 we, or 25 we rent. And how many hands on board? My husband and I, and we bring in two offshore labor from Trinidad. Huh, okay. You also are a politician. Elected official. Oh, you don't like the word politician, eh? No, it's a different category. <laughs> okay, understood. Why'd you run for town council? Well, there were things happening in the Holland Marsh that I just didn't feel, um, we, we weren't getting the right representation through the incumbent that I beat out. And believe me, I never thought that I had it in me to be an elected official. I thought you had to have all this great education and like, what do I know about politics? It turns out you need a functioning brain cell, you need to care about people, and you need to be involved. And- You're um, three for three. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and and so I, I got involved and my farmers got behind me and they, they demonstrated very loudly they wanted change. So what's your view of how well the green belt is working? Well, I can give you my view, and, and it's, not a terrible, it's not a terrible view. I mean, the Holland Marsh is a specialty crop area within the Green Belt. We don't have the same pressures that maybe some farmers would have in other places in the Green Belt. We, we, pressures in what respect? Well, development pressures. Okay. Um, we're in a floodplain, so we're, we're not, unless something drastically changed somewhere and, and we run out of land altogether to develop, then we're, we, we don't face those same growth um, pressures. We, we, have the, we have the traffic pressures because of the, the, the development around us. So I would say, um, this is where I'm going to kind of steer away from what I thought I was going to say originally, is it depends who you talk to within the green belt, whether it's a good thing or whether it's a bad thing. Because every farmer, each, there, there's so many different sectors in agriculture and they all have different needs. And um, so their, their experiences within the green belt would be different than perhaps mine are. But what I would say is I think the Green Belt was a tremendous idea bringing it forward. I think the last 10 years, we've been on a, we've been on a learning curve. We've been learning um, what doesn't work and what is working. Uh, I think it was last fall, York Region, it undertook um, a workshop with, it, with various, um, with the nine municipalities within York Region and various environmental groups within York Region. And what they were doing is they wanted to see what had worked with the green belt, where, where, we could make, um, where we could make improvements. And when you say what's working, what does that mean? Well, I just think, it, like, is it following the green belt? Is, it, is the green belt actually performing the way it was intended to be performing? As in saving farmland? As in saving farmland, um, the environmental component, which is, you know, to me it's one and the same. Being a farmer, I'm a steward of the land and some people might not really see it that way, but we are, farmers are stewards of the land. We're the first stewards of the land. I mean, if we don't look after the land, it's certainly not going to look after us. You're out of business. We're out of business. Yeah. So what's not working? Well, see, I, 
I think what we need to have is is a really moving forward and we are coming up for a review with the Greenbelt plan this year, although it seems to be a huge mystery when that's going to be occurring. I sit on a number of boards and, and we're starting to put feelers out and say, okay, you know, this is something we need to start thinking about. We need to start um, putting our ducks in a row and, and decide, okay, what can we improve? We have the green belt, there's talk of it. It has expanded in Niagara, I think, this, that last year, and there's more talk of it going to be expanding some more. Um, why don't we sit down and have a really great discussion with those people who are going to be impacted? And I think, and, and I could be wrong here because I wasn't part of the original process. Um, that was pre-elected official days. And, but I think now we need to really be cognizant of the people that are going to be potentially impacted. Impacted by, how? Impacted um, by, you know, land values. Um, if they're not going to be able to sell their property for retirement purposes, is there some going to be? Is there going to be some kind of compensation down the road for them having been stuck? It's not their choice to be in the green belt. That's that's where their farm is. Perhaps mm -hmm. that's where their farm has been for the last three or four generations. But are they, they going to pick up and go? I don't think so. Some have. Mm -hmm. Realistically, are more going to? No. So I think we have to have we have to sit down and have discussions with not just large farm operators but mid-size and smaller farm operators as well. Sit down with the powers that be and say, okay, you know what? This is not going to work. Um, this could work. Maybe we're going to have to reach a compromise mm -hmm. somewhere along the line. But just so everyone understands, if you've got a working farm right now and you're in your whatever, 60s, 70s, and you decided you've had enough mm -hmm. and you want to sell, but nobody wants to buy the farm and take the farm. Yep. You're out of luck? You're out of luck. I mean, and, and th th there's probably some use for it, but it's not the same as if it wasn't within the green belt where mm -hmm. you could sell to a developer and make, you know, tens of millions of dollars. What I would like to see is, um, and this is part of the discussion piece, is we need to have more consistent language mm -hmm. because you have, well, you, you've got your PPS, which is your provincial policy statement, and it's, and it's last April was very exciting a little bit what for was exciting about it? the farmers because um, or the exciting part for the farmers was the piece they were adding in about value added it was going to be permitted on farms now we had a meeting in York region and um, I was a little bit disappointed with the number of farmers that showed up so moving with the moving towards a, a green belt review I really would like to see more farmers and I will certainly be pushing more mm. farmers to attend and have their voices heard well, one of the things we do here is that there's not enough actual concrete information about what's going on in the Green Belt. Yep. The province, I think we'll hear the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario tell us in our next interview that, that there's not enough information being gathered. But Professor Henry Cummings, University of Guelph, has apparently gone out and crunched some of the numbers on what's going on. And here's what he's found, and we're going to share that information with you and our viewers now. He has found that there are more than 856,000 acres of farmland in the Green Belt. That's 6.7% of all Ontario farmland and 10.5% of all Ontario farms. Having said that, there is a decline in farmland acreage, and we've got it from the years 06 to 11 here, in the Greenbelt off more than 8%, in the rest of Ontario off almost 5%, in Middlesex, southwestern Ontario off over 1%, in Waterloo off more than 2%, in, even in eastern Ontario and Ottawa off more than 5%. Why do you think the decline in all of that farmland is happening? You know what? I'm not an expert in that area. And, and when it comes to numbers, numbers and I are not friends. Um, <laughs> but but what, I will, what I will say is I think um, while a lot of the focus has been put on protecting farmland, and it's a tremendous, it's a, it's a tremendous initiative, and, and it was needed. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to say that it wasn't. We need to be protecting our farmland. But I think another component, and, and moving forward, I think we really need to be cognizant of this, is... How do we keep those farms viable now? How about how much we pay for that food? Um, while, we, while it is a local market, mm -hmm. the reality is we deal in a global marketplace. And the chain stores are promoting. I mean, not that chain stores are bad. They're, they're our friend. I mean, we couldn't sell our product if we didn't have the chain stores and if we didn't have our urban folks buying those things. I mean, we need that relationship. Um, but it's a global marketplace. So while people want to buy local, the reality is we are so restricted as farmers as to what we can do, it's really hurting our bottom line. So having, being able to make up that extra income because you've got cheaper products coming in from another country, they may, many of our training partners do not have the same rules and regs that they have to follow, that we mm -hmm. have to follow. So while we have the green belt and it's a fabulous first step, I think we need to do more 
to understand what the global marketplace is and, and, and jump in there. Well, you're quite right. We live in a global, uh, as trite as this sounds to say it, we do live in a global world and we can get our food from almost anywhere nowadays. Mm -hmm. If we can get food that's as good as yours and cheaper offshore, why shouldn't we? Yep, and, and that therein lies the problem. So our farmers are saying, you know what? I mean, speaking to those numbers that you just recited to me mm -hmm. a little while ago, um, that could be part of the problem because the farmers are saying, you know what? I'm beating my head up against a wall. Why am I doing this? And, and they're not going to. I mean, we've got young farmers. I'm in the Holland Marsh. I, and, and this is where my part of the green belt is a little bit different than a farmer who is not in a floodplain, who's mm -hmm. in, on mineral soil or what we call high land. Um, our, our, young, our young farmers are not able to afford to buy the farmland that they need to continue on to grow, to get bigger, mm -hmm. so they can compete in the global marketplace. I mean, you hear that the, the land values have plummeted in the green belt. In the marsh, <laughs> for some inexplicable reason, why you'd want to live in a floodplain is beyond me, but anyway, um, those prices are going up. And well, it makes it really hard for our young farmers to get into that farming. I, I wonder if it's because you're, you are somewhere between, say, Newmarket and Bradford, right? If I, I mean, we're getting very local here, but... Yep, Newmarket but, is east, Bradford is north. Okay, those towns are growing relatively quickly. Yep. Does that affect what's happening in your part of the world? Not, not with actual development, with mm -hmm. traffic, it does. Mm -hmm. It does, because those urban pressures we are feeling. One of the first things I did when I became an elected official is at all the entrances to my section of the Holland Marsh, because the Holland Marsh is York Region and Simcoe County, and King Township is York Region, I had signs put up that said, this is an active farming community. And in the hopes that people would understand, okay, when you're driving through here, and we want people to come visit, we really do, it's a beautiful area. And this is where you get, you know, a large percentage of your, of your vegetables, at least your carrots and onions and, and some other, we, we grow 40 different crops in the marsh. And um, so we want people to come and visit, but when there's an accident on the 400 or on Highway 9, and they have to get to their home in East Gwillimberry or Bradford or Newmarket, they don't want to wait and until that traffic clears up or whatever or if they have to wait three or four stoplights to turn left to go on to Bathurst North they're going to cut through the marsh mm -hmm. and the thing that drives me nuts and I'm the main tractor driver on our farm I'm driving a anywhere from 120 to 150 horsepower tractor I've got eight tons of vegetables behind me I can't stop on a dime mm -hmm. and these people will come flying through so we feel the the urban pressures through traffic volumes mm -hmm. And people don't get that, do they? People they who don't. live in cities, they don't really get that. I, I don't think they do. And, and it's, it's unfortunate. I mean, and it's not even people, um, like, again, with the Green Belt, it's about recreation and enjoying the great outdoors. We get a lot of cyclists coming through the marsh because it's flat and they love it. They can get their speeds up. It's great. I remember this one time I was coming out of the field. It was a very wet spot. And the, it, this is really funny because, oddly enough, the vehicular traffic, they saw what I was going to do. If I stopped, I was going to be mired and I'd put our whole operation behind at least half an hour or, or longer. And I thought, I'm not going to be the one to do that. So I thought, I looked both ways, the vehicular traffic stopped, this cyclist kept going and I said, you know what, I'm not stopping. I'm going to keep going. So what happened? And <laughs> Well, I got out in the middle of the road and I slammed my parking brake on and I yelled things at that cyclist that should never come out of a woman's mouth because I could have killed him. I mean, my tires are six feet tall. I could have run this guy over and, and they're you not... You didn't, though. I didn't, know. What no. happened? <laughs> well, he just kept going. It's like some crazy woman yelling things at me from a tractor. I don't know. And, you want um, to tell us what you yelled at him? <laughs> no. <laughs> But it wasn't kind. Want to tell us the first letter of the words that you yelled at him? No, it was a lot of expletives. <laughs> why, why do I get that sense? Yeah. But but you know what? And 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 that's just the frustration that we feel. Or or they fly by and they give me the finger. I can't stop. I'm 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 still at work. You're on your way home, or, or going to run your kids to baseball. I had to get my kids' grandmother to run them to their activities because I'm still working. So city folks need to have a little more appreciation of that kind of thing. Well, I think so. I think um, I think we need more um, education hmm. and more communication that well, way. Well, you're doing it right now. Because we're partners. So that's good. We're partners. Good. Exactly. Let's uh, in our last few minutes here. I want to touch on the. Greenbelt's been around for 10 years, but they're now embarking, the provinces, on a 10-year looking forward review mm -hmm. of what ought to be done differently. Yes. If you had, so, what's at the top of your list of things you'd like to see done differently? Oh, wow. Where do I start? Um, I would like to see things aligned, like, 
the green belt is supposed to be for agriculture. Part of, that's part of the, the reasoning. And um, back in the fall, I was, I was able to be part of a series on the green belt that it was between the Toronto Star and Friends of the Green Belt. And I was really tickled pink that they asked me to be part of their tweet party. And, um, and it was interesting because the night that we were talking about local food and the importance of food to people, the retweet and mention numbers were like 80,000. <laughs> the night when we talked about recreation and the great outdoors, it was only around the 20,000 mark. So that tells you something right there. Yep. Food is hugely important. And whether it's local or global, food is important. So I think moving forward, what we need to be doing is we need to be Okay, we've, we've made some steps in the provincial policy statement that allow for value added. It's not perfect. We have a long way to go, but it's a start. And I think with the green belt, we need to start saying, okay, you know what? We're going to restrict this. This is going to be for agriculture. But you know what? John Doe, he really needs to have a value added operation on his farm to process his carrots and celery. Because you know what? If he can do that, we're going to get healthier foods into the schools. So we need to be starting mush sector and stuff like that. So whose responsibility is it to, to pay up for the value added? I think it could be a partnership. And I don't Between? think... Be between farmers and the province, between local municipal governments. I, I, I don't think it's something that just it should be all up to the province to do. I, I don't think that's fair. The province is running a $12.5 billion deficit. They're, yeah. they're not looking to spend more money on new things. Exactly. So a few strokes of the pen and changing some policy that would make it easier for farmers to do what they do without having them taxed at, a say, a commercial rate. So, and then not just limit it to what is grown on their farm. We live in Canada. We have a seasonal growing season. So, you know, chain stores want 12, supply 12 months a year. We can't do that. So we need to do something to offset the income. So if we could allow them to have the value added, but say, okay, you know what? Jane Doe down the road, she's got some carrots. She's, she, she grows 20 or 30 acres. We could buy from her and process her product on our farm. So I, I think it's just a matter of having some really great conversations, having the stakeholders at the table, having, having the farmers. I've always said, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I think our farmers really need to be at that table and, and being, putting the realities on the table, not just somebody sitting in academia or somebody drawing lines or they need to go out, they need to do soil samples to make sure the land they're protecting is prime agricultural land. Is it a class one to four? Is it? And, and then have these discussions with the farmers, like what is going to work with you? And, and have the lang language consistent. I was reading, um, I, sit on the, I sit on a number of boards and committees, but one of them I sit on is the York Egg Liaison Committee. And we were listening to this presentation, and it was one of the land use policy documents, and I forget which one it was, and they were re re making a reference to horse and pony. And in my head I was thinking, what the hell is that? Sorry. I thought, what the hell is that? And that's equine. We'll call it equine. It's not horse and pony. That, you know, and so I think we need to, we, they need to, we all need to be sitting down, have the, the stake, the people who are going to be impacted by decisions made with this land use policy document. And I think they need to be made aware of, you know, that's a great idea, but you know what, maybe we can tweak it this way and have the people who know part of the conversation. Well, we're happy to have had this farmer at this table tonight for this conversation. Well, I'm honored. I'm, I'm thrilled to have been able to be here. Avia Eek, it's great to meet you, and thanks so much, even if you aren't a politician, but merely an elected official. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.